Thank you for coming um, to to the Dharma Talk tonight at Nyingma Institute. My name's Erica Rosenberg, and I've been I've been involved with Nyingma Institute since 1989 when I walked here in here as a graduate student uh, to take one of my first meditation class ever, and I'm very grateful to Nyingma for um, being my Dharma home for these many years, and it's been. Um, I haven't been there as much over the last couple of years, but I've always felt so welcome and also so supported. Um, not only is Nyingma the first place I've, I ever took a meditation class, but it was the first place I ever taught meditation back in 2001. And um, also it's, so now today it's the first place I've given a, a, a Dharma talk on Zoom. Um, so this was, um, yeah, last January I gave a, it's interesting, it was almost to the year, um, year to date, that I gave my last Dharma talk at Nyingma Institute, sitting in the, medita- the, the downstairs meditation hall in the um, main building, which is a beautiful place. If you've never been there, I um, encourage you to visit it when it's safe for us to do those sorts of things again, because there's nothing like being surrounded by all the sacred art and the prayer wheels spinning out their infinite compassion mantras. It's a really special place to, to be and to practice. So, with that... Maybe, I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah, and Allie, could you mute your microphone? Thank you. I don't have muting ability. Great. So, um, I'm going to hit this. just to indicate that we're starting now. And um, even though this is more of a talk than a meditation center or meditation class, I'm inviting you to take this moment to settle in a little bit. Maybe you were in a more active mode before coming here, taking a few breaths and just kind of cueing into the space. And I'm really grateful for your showing up for this because I'm really, um, I'm going to be using this opportunity to explore some um, topics that I've been personally very motivated to um, develop further in my practice and in my life. Um, I've been working with compassion for a long time, but this notion of what I'm calling fierce compassion for lack of I don't know if that's the label I'm going to stick with for this, but right now I'm, um, you know, really using this label fierce compassion to refer to this kind of, you know, um, intensely motivated, engaged compassion for really working on suffering in the world in a deep way. And as a teacher and practitioner, this has really been something that I've been motivated to explore this, this, this transition from practice, being on the cushion, what's, um, what your motivations or thoughts or intentions are in your head and heart, to taking it into the world, partly, you know, just into our daily lives, which is something that should be encouraged for anybody who's been working on compassion in their life. And you're probably not just practicing, but, you know, behaving in the world and engaging with others and bringing what you learn to that. But this is also about kind of pushing it out just a little bit further to take on the, some challenges, take on real problems, and to make a difference. So um, just to say a few things about um, format or what we're doing here, um, I'm going to be kind of informally, I'll just be looking at all of you like this, but occasionally I'm going to share my screen because... Um, I've never used slides in a Dharma talk, but it's different when you're in this environment, you know? And um, I have a few slides that I think might help facilitate understanding as as I'm presenting some ideas to you. So I'll be alternating between this format and showing you some slides and talking there. And I will pause at various points and invite some discussion and see if you have any questions um, of clarification or just ideas to share during that time. All right. Sound, sound like a plan. Okay, good. Olivia gave me the thumbs up. So I'm, I'm that that's the word I needed. 
Right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because I made this really cool, um, uh, where, not wrong picture, and I'm gonna share in this kind of slide mode rather than presentation mode because I made this really nice opening slide that I thought was super, um, super worth sharing with you. Because if, if, if there's an image that kind of conveys fierce compassion, I think we see this here in this beautiful tanka, which um, depicts one of the wrathful manifestations of Avalokiteshvara or Shenrenznik, who is the Bodhisattva of compassion. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with, um, you know, some of the Tibetan Buddhist iconography, um, one of the things that you see are these different manifestations of um, some of these deities. Sometimes they appear, you know, as, you know, uh, um, in a more typical calm human form, sometimes feminine, sometimes masculine, depending on what you need. Sometimes you need a mother, sometimes you need a warrior. And what we see with Hayagriva, I think I'm pronouncing that right, Hayagriva, um, is this wrathful or um, kind of fierce manifestation of compassion. And from what I've gathered, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the character, the Incredible Hulk from, you know, the comic book legend, but Incredible Hulk was this, um, you know, his he's in a human form, but when he was like fiercely engaged to, to be of service, to help right an injustice or save somebody, he becomes this big green monster with big muscles and all that. So this is like the incredible Hulk version of um, the manifestation of compassion. So that's why I have that here. Um, but so we'll be looking at this kind of fierce compassion, what it takes to kind of bring compassion into the world, into action. And I have listed here, um, my, you know, my affiliations, I've been involved with the Institute for um, a couple decades now, more than that. I also, um, I'm a psychologist by training, an academic psychologist, a researcher, and a meditation teacher, um, and contemplative, I don't know, whatever. I, I, these things fuse in my life, the, the um, academic work and the Dharma work, and they have for many years. I've been very privileged to do research at the Center for Mind and Brain at UC Davis, where we've done studies on meditation, on how meditation affects your life. Um, and we've done some work on compassion. I've also been involved at both the uh, Compassion Institute and also Stanford University, developing um, you know compassion training programs based on Tibetan Buddhism and on psychology and Western science that, to kind of bring these together in a package that um, is accessible to um, more people than, than just, you know, you don't have to have come from any particular religious or um, spiritual tradition. So I've been kind of involved in the study and the practice of these things for a while. And in my own life and work, I've been very motivated to, um, you know, in terms of my intention, why I wanted to do this talk. And I'm grateful to the Institute for always giving me um, a lot of freedom to explore new areas and so I'm trying out some stuff with you right now but in my own life I've been trying to get more um, over the past few years very very much more engaged in social and racial justice trying to um, make a difference in the world and trying to see as a compassion educator starting to explore how do we get to that place you know if you know because there's a lot of challenges when you want to make a difference in the world and um, so I'm just gonna be charting that territory a little bit. And um, I want to pay homage to when this talk is happening. It didn't really occur to me when I offered to do a Dharma talk, we were looking for a date and this date came up and I said, wow, this is amazing timing for something on Fierce Compassion because this is the weekend when we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr who was probably one of the greatest compassion warriors that this country has known, who met suffering with love and kindness and a big heart and a lot of bravery. Um, so I wanted to share a couple um, quotes from Martin Luther King that I think are really relevant to the topic at hand today. And, the, and all of these come from a collection of sermons in the, that appeared for the first time, I guess, in this collection called Strength to Love that has a number of his sermons, but this first, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Which really taps into the service element of um, how we spend our time, which is something that motivates me. 
Another is um, courage is an inner resolution to go forward despite obstacles, which is um, when we try to engage with problems in the world, things that are big problems, things where there's a lot of suffering, things that feel almost hard to scale because they're so massive. Um, we're going to hit a lot of obstacles and we're going to encounter a lot of our own fear. And so courage is is one of the things we have to grapple with and ultimately we will build if we engage in compassionate action. And this last quote is probably is a very famous quote and I um, changed the gender, I made it gender neutral um, from the 1963 version. But the ultimate measure of a person is not where they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where they stand at times of challenge and controversy. So, um, yeah, um, so that kind of, again kind of captures, you know, what we're dealing with and um, where we're going. So, a couple more things. Okay, I'm going to go off um, slide mode for a second. I don't want to, it's really tough. I don't want to be just talking at slides. I like to see some faces, although mostly half of you have your faces visible and many of you have just your names. So I'll go back and forth. But so we're going to look at this stretching, really, um, bringing compassion off the cushion into the world, which is any kind of compassion practice re is, is encouraging you to be a more compassionate person, not just in your meditation, but in how you engage with people. And I know people have their own reserves of compassion because I realize that possibly there are people here who are not um, involved with meditation. So I'm not trying to even imply that that's the only route there. But f I know a lot of um, a lot of us here, and I know for me myself, it's about how do we take it from, you know, we're reinforcing good intentions, we want to be of help to others, we're reinforcing this notion of, you know, um, may there be less suffering in the world. How do we take that from those wishes to actually doing something? So um, to to take that a little further, I do want to define a couple terms and I guess I'll have to go back to my screen share for that. Um, I just don't want this to feel too much like an academic class. This is first of all what I'm going to do. I really want to make clear that I'm just starting to develop my ideas in this area. There's a lot of stuff that's been brewing and I'm using this talk as an opportunity to kind of formalize some of it but it's it's a work in progress and I really value um, questions and input from those of you who are attending. So this is what I want to do today. I want to talk about what we mean about compassion and fierce compassion. I want to talk about what's important preparation. And when I say preparation, what I'm talking about is um, as an individual, and we could think of this on a community level too, but as an individual, if you want to work on becoming what we fiercely compassionate, or we have all these different labels, a compassion warrior, you know, is another label that's sometimes used. What are the, what do you need to do? How, how do you prepare? And how do you take care of yourself if you're on that journey? Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that come up with this kind of work. Um, the issue of aversion, meeting those places that make you pull back naturally. And how do you work with that place of encountering something that feels aversive and yet still moving in? And when should you move in? And when should you wait? So there's this notion of the edge spaces, you know, those places where you're just getting to the precipice and it might be too much. Um, so we'll talk about looking at what that aversive space is or where those edges are, but also about growth, which involves to some extent a need to stretch your limits a little bit. Then also looking at some of the emotions that come up with this work and just by way of I'm kind of contextualizing this, um, I, one of the areas that I've worked in for many years in my career in psychology is the psychology of emotions. So I pay a lot of attention to that in this area and they're, they play a lot of, a big role in compassion cultivation generally. And especially when we move into this more fiery, shall we say, form of uh, compassion. Emotions are important um, as motivators. They're important as they inform you of how you're being in the world, and we'll elaborate on that, um, but they also can be areas we have to be cautious around. 
And then to talk about action, what do we mean by action? What do we need for action? And then also, what, is, what are actions that are compassionate? What are different? What does that look like? Um, I'll see how much we get into that. But I do want to say something about practices that you can do. And I'm typing it right here. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing. That's sort of um, where we're going. And, um, but to define, I want to make sure that we're all clear on, you know, what compassion is. And, um, and it's, you know, we all have, a lot of us have an intuitive sense of it. It's important that it's, you know, it's related to love, it's related to kindness, but it's not exactly the same. It is a relational thing. It's something that arises when we're cons con confronted with suffering. And I should say, I have another suffering, but it could be your own suffering. Just when we're confronted with suffering, in fact, I'm going to take that out and feel motivated to see that suffering relieved. So it implies that there's some degree of paying attention to what's going on, like noticing, and this is why it's important to cultivate some awareness, some mindfulness, see what's going on around you, notice what's going on within you, attending to it, and seeing where the suffering is, and then feeling moved by it. Um, I, not everybody subscribes to this um, particular viewpoint but this is where the the empathic connection can build you know how does it affect you to see that another one is su somebody's suffering how does it affect you to see that you're suffering that's a kind of juice of it the emotion of it it might have despair it might have anger it has different flavors to it there's the motivational aspect of compassion that you care enough about what's going on you really want to see the suffering relieved and then we get to this last piece that um, of action and action is like what are you going are you going to actually move from all this you know intention and wish and wanting to cultivate a wish for the compassion for the suffering to be relieved are you going to then do anything and thinking about what action means and one of the things that when I um, am teaching um, compassion classes I actually really um, remind people that sometimes if we think of action as a behavioral choice that sometimes the most compassionate behavioral choice you can make is to simply be present with somebody or to listen to somebody and to realize that when we say something like action, it doesn't require us to have to have a solution to a problem. It's more about what are you going to do right now. So I'm going to stop for a minute with the slides and, you know, resist the impulse to just like barrel through that and just open it up if there's any Spend a couple minutes if anybody has um, any questions or comments at this point. And if you do, you can physically raise your hand. I have two screens of people, or you can um, electronically raise your hand. Does anybody um, have any questions? Or you can, if I don't see that you have your hand raised, you can unmute yourself and say, hey, Erica, yeah, I do. I have a question. Okay, and who's that? Chris, 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 where are you? Okay, I'll put on speaker mode and then you'll come up. Go ahead, Chris. There you are. Hi, Chris. You mentioned finding the margins or the edge of where action should be taken or not taken. Mm -hmm. And this has been actually the reason I came to this talk was to hear your answer to that question because I'm impressed by the fact that some people think they're doing something compassionate and actually do harm, and other right. people think they're doing compassion and do good. Mm -hmm. And they, many people can't seem to make the distinction because it takes a lot of deep insight into a situation to know when an intervention is actually counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Some people think they know answers when they actually don't. So I'd like to hear you elaborate on that, that margin you just described. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and I will, I'm actually going to be talking about that a lot more. I was just sort of mapping the territory of what I was going to talk about. But those edge, but I'll say a couple things now since you just asked about it. And um, I think one of the most important things about um, bringing mindfulness or awareness and heart to, to, to suffering in the world is to, um, first of all, remember to ask if someone wants help. 
that's, I mean, sometimes we insert ourselves in places where people think we see someone suffering and they may or may not want our assistance. So to make sure that it's safe, to see what, to see what you have that to offer and to constantly be in the, um, or continuously when you're in that space, to be engaging and paying attention to the feedback you're getting. Is it making a difference? Is it harmful or helpful? And to, but probably prior to everything I just said, is the role of intention here. Why is it that you're helping? You know, um, are you helping because you think you have something to, you know, you see that someone's hurt, you want to be of help. That's a great motivation and intention. Do you have something that can be beneficial here? Um, have you checked to see that, we can't always check to see if somebody need you know is it wants our help but but if you can you should ask you know and then gauge what you did to see what the response is those are just a couple quick things but what you raise chris is a really important thing and it's territory that has to be visited over and over again in this process uh, so thank you for bringing it up and we'll dive into that a little bit more deeply later, I hope. And so uh, we'll we'll see if any of this comes back up at that time. Thanks for your question. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Because I'll get back to it then because I have a lot, lot to cover. And if I don't cover it all, it's okay. Um, well, it's a good start. Okay, so back to the slides, because I want to show you a few things. So this was like one definition of compassion. Um, and I'm to, to be honest, I'm drawing on this from the work I've done as a teacher of compassion cultivation training, which is an eight-week compassion um, training program that we developed at Stanford University. Um, Tubdem Jimpa was the founding developer, and then a number of... Um, meditation teachers, Western psychologists, a, a few of us were involved in um, the process. But this is sort of the working definition I use in that class, but there's a lot of other kind of shorthand things that I think are very helpful to think of um, how to define compassion. And one of them is to meet suffering with kindness, which I think is a, a, a wonderfully simple way to talk about what compassion is, meeting suffering with kindness. Um, and suffering of all kinds of forms. We won't go into a detailed discussion of what suffering is, um, but we'll get to it more. I will get to it. Okay, so if we have this, this is compassion. And you see, if you look at this list of things, I mean, even all compassion work involves courage, you know, because you're, you're allowing yourself to be present with suffering. You're not fleeing from it, which is, which is, a, a, a real normal, you know, reaction to suffering. It's be, noticing it, being present with it, and um, using your response to it as sort of fuel um, to motivate action. But where, why this term fears compassion, and what, what, how do we move further from it? Um, and fears compassion, I'll just say it, um, fears refers to sometimes the emotions that are involved, because there can be righteous indignation at a, at a horrible injustice um, that might be a motivating factor, or it might be that kind of, you know, the, the fury, you know, makes you super powerful, but we'll talk about that. Anger is something you have to be very careful with. Um, but it, importantly, it's a real expansion on this action piece. Um, and that's why I'm not sure either. It, I think of engaged compassion. I think of fierce compassion maybe is one form of it. Um, but there's a couple things that I can say about um, fierce compassion. And again, I wrote here, is this even the right word? I'm still ex exploring that, but expands on the action piece. And there's this bravery about moving through obstacles and aversion to be of service. But that doesn't mean ignoring those. You know, um, one of the things that's important if you're trying to build this um, greater um, compassion muscles, shall we say, is to notice what's going on. Know if you're pushing yourself too far. Um, fierce compassion is courageous and builds courage because you're, you're, you're putting yourself in a situation that might initially feel a little threatening, initially feel a little dangerous. Um, and um, when I talk about preliminaries, um, preparation in a few minutes, 
you'll see why that's important because you have to have your you have to know how to find your ground you have to pay attention to what's going on around you you have to be able to pay attention to what's going on within you and know when you've met your limit on what you can do and when to you know and when to pause etc so it's a lot there's a lot of bravery of it you have to be respectful of fear when it arises because fear is an indicator that there might be threat so you need to be able to look at fear make choices based on it but not be paralyzed by it but uh, the other thing i think of as a characteristic of um this kind of fierce compassion is that it's it's brave we've kind of made that point you know you might be a little scared but let's say you've decided you have what it takes you think you can make a difference and you're going to move ahead so you might still be fearful but moving ahead right that's the bravery part um but there's it occurred to me also there's an honesty in it there's an honesty in it not too afraid to not being afraid to call to call things as they are you know to name a problem even if it's socially uncomfortable um the um speak the truth even if people might not like you for it and the people who've been the the real change makers in history have often done that you know speaking what's true and the i mentioned that fierce compassion can be fiery so this is sort of where the fierce thing comes from that it can be motivated not always but sometimes by this righteous indignation or anger provoked by moral injustice and um social injustice i mean certainly if you think you know of what's happened in the united states over this past year and the exposure um that of of all the deep social injustices racial injustices that have been going on for since the founding of this country that have been hidden and tried to be addressed but are still underneath and deeply deeply divisive in our country it's become incredibly um apparent um over the past 9 months um and the wrongs the injustices you know things like the murder of George Floyd which really you know at the end of may opened us up you know kind of ripped us open to see the the depth of systemic racism in this country so these are the things that are rightly infuriating right um so that kind of outrage can be motivating um uh my co- and it can help you have a reason to make a difference but we have to be careful uh with the anger which I'll talk about in Well, I'll talk about it now. I mean, you have to be careful with the anger because anger is hot. Anger can lead to rage, which can be really destructive. And there's a difference between like the anger that informs you that something's been wrong and tells you that something needs to be done versus always acting from the place of being enraged. So anger can be informative, but like plans for action should be are are probably best when they've been motivated by if they've been motivated by anger fine but to be um mindful in the choice of action options you know and there's a lot of difference between activists on whether they think that violence is part of it or whether it should always be something that's peaceful because um compassion formally comes from a place of starting without harming right starting from a place of not harming and trying to reduce suffering so there is a fine line that can come up when you're dealing with this fiercely motivated um compassion and i'm just personally trying starting to explore those boundaries um my a colleague of mine in spain who's a compassion teacher there um who works on um social injustice actually she's been teaching compassion to um at this nonprofit Pro- proyecto esperanza where they um are helping women who've been um migrant women who've been victims of um human trafficking it's a, it's a, there's a lot of it's desperate suffering in in that arena and she talks about fierce compassion she said compassion turns fierce in situations of social injustice and violence so there is that fire that could be there um i mentioned here also this when it, so when do we see that fiery compassion moral social injustice but also emerges in like protection of offspring maternal or caregiver protection of offspring and um so that's another place 
Um, preparation and protection. These are aspects or qualities that are like the minimum <laughs> that seem essential to me um, to um, really develop a, an engaged compassion. They're part of compassion cultivation. These are, these are aspects of, of um, the development of compassion and com that, that are necessary, it seems, to, um, to be able to do this work, maintain a compassionate existence in the world just with everyday stuff, and continue to kind of reach out beyond your limits, grow a little bit from this. And um, attention and awareness, you know, really have you worked with your mind to try to stabilize your attention, to try to cultivate some amount of um, mindfulness, to um, be able to notice what's going on, um, attend more broadly to situations, be aware both of situ what's out there and what's in here. Those, that quality is essential because if you harken back to what I was talking about, like what is compassion, you have to notice that, notice that there's a problem that needs to be addressed. You know, so that's a big key. Um, and notice the world out there as well as the world in here. Self-compassion is absolutely cru critical to this process. And um, why? Well, if we think of self-compassion as noticing your own suffering and being willing to attend to it and do something to relieve it, um, when self-care is really urgent, if you are a helper, we know this from people who are in helping professions, that there's a lot of risk of burnout because people, you know, get overwhelmed. They don't take care of themselves. They're so busy serving everybody else that they don't attend to their own needs. So if you've developed some degree of self-compassion, um, in whatever way, maybe you're blessed to naturally have a lot of that or from life experience or from practice or all three of those things. Um, it helps cultivate a sense of attention to how you're doing. Am I wiped out? Am I getting edgy? Is it Maybe I'm too tense right now to take this problem on. These are all questions that can come up um, for attending to self-care. And um, one of the things that um, people I know in trauma work and, you know, and other areas where they're constantly being taxed is that... Um, Self-care is non-negotiable. It's like a mantra, you know, for people training in that area. Self-care is non-negotiable. You have to take care of yourself. If you're going to be a, a helper, a compassion warrior, um, a supporter of others, if, if, if you're weak and cracked, then you're unable to be of service anyway. So take care of this thing. Take care of it. Self-compassion is also really important for letting go. Um, and... Uh, I'm going to go over here for a minute because I just want to see all your faces. Um, so I mentioned self, self-compassion, you know, awareness, self-compassion and common humanity. But I'm packing the self-compassion piece some more is this, um, there's a self-care piece, but self-compassion is really important for letting go, you know, like not, a, you know, you have a problem you're working on. You can't do anything more about it now. You'll wake up in the morning and do more with it. Can you let go of that and have a restful evening? Or are you just going to obsess about it all night and not be able to sleep? That kind of letting go. Letting go in your mind of those things you get hooked into, which is super, super important um, for well-being. And it's super important if you're in this field because if if you're working on problems, big, big, deep problems in the world, and you're constantly working on it, right? Um, that can lead to burnout. You need to, need to be able to know when you need some space so you can sleep, so that you can rest, so that you can do the self-care. And the way that self-compassion works for helping you let go is you, if you've been practicing with noticing your own suffering, noticing um, how you feel, and let's say you're motivated to, to you know, You've been working with phrases, you've been working with practices, may I be free from suffering, may I be well, etc. Eventually that's going to get in and you notice when you're doing those things that are wearing you out. That I'm, I'm thinking about this all night, oh I have to worry about it. Do you have to worry about it? 
you know, like, oh God, I got to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, you've done X, Y, and Z about what's going to happen tomorrow. Can you loosen that hook a little bit? Can you put that over there? Not that it's not going to come up in your mind again. It's okay. It'll come, come up in your mind, but can you bring your awareness back to dinner, you know, or that I have to feed myself or there's something else going on. So that's the um, letting go element and why self-compassion plays a role in that. The other piece that I um, mentioned as cr crucial to preparation or maintenance work is this notion of common humanity. And that's important for common humanity is something that um, we use a lot in, we talk a lot about it in people who work with compassion. It's recognizing what's common to all of us, you know, that even though we have differences in, you know, where we grew up, what our um, socioeconomic status is, what our beliefs are, what the color of our skin is, how old we are, what our sexual orientation is. There's all these disparities, differences between us. Underneath it, we're all trying to get through life and just be moderately comfortable and not be miserable. That that's, that's the message of common humanity, that we have much more in common than um, we have different. Um, I want to mention, however, this distinction, a, a, a rephrasing that, that my colleague Sylvia, who I mentioned earlier, who's done the work with um, women in sexual trafficking, that she points out this difference. She thinks she likes to talk about shared versus non-shared humanity because she, think, she said common humanity can lull us into believing, oh, we're not really any different, we're all the same. And it fails to recognize that there are huge disparities, there are huge injustices, and there are and, um, different, different um, resources that people have that can make a big difference in the world. So uh, there's a risk of common humanity glossing over that, and that she thinks it's better. I really appreciate this distinction of talking about what's shared versus not shared, or, or common humanity means that, you know, what's common to us versus what's different to us, but sometimes the differences are big. And I don't think, I think it's important, it's important not to trivialize that. So, um, okay. Now what I want to get on to is I want to get into talking about this aversion and growth and meeting the edge um, piece. And I guess, are there any pressing questions by anybody? I can, I'll leave some time at the end for this too. So I don't see any. I'm scrolling through you in my little tiny way of display with my slides up. So I'll just go on because um, I think having these slides helps. So, you know, as um, we discussed a moment ago, this issue of there being aversion, this issue of there being um, when you first get into... Um, even compa whether you're talking about compassion, I want to say regular compa compassion or heroic compassion. I'm not. I don't mean heroic, by the way. Heroic is can be fierce, but um, heroic compassion usually is a term that's reverse reserved for people who just like totally risk their lives to save others. Like jump into the freezing Potomac when a plane goes down. There are these rare case or uh, Wesley Aut Autry, this man who. Um, um, it was about 10 years ago in New York, jumped and saw this man fall onto the subway rails before a train train was coming. And he jumped down on top of him and he flattened his body and they were tucked down under the third rail and the train went over and he saved this man. Um, but he threw himself down without, I mean, these are heroic compassion. So um, I'm not really talking about that because heroic compassion seems, people just seem to go immediate, it's like an immediate response. I'm talking about when you're working with this growth of reaching out and um, to even when you're just working with compassion in your life and you're trying to reach out to being more compassionate to someone who you've had lots of arguments with. So this isn't necessarily fierce compassion, but we, we hit obstacles. Like maybe there's someone, a colleague or a family member who we 
have a hard time with, we always get in arguments with, we actually might not even like interacting with, but you have to, you know? So you, this issue of resistance or obstacles to our compassion comes up all the time if you're working with compassion. And it comes up in a big way when you're taking on big problems or working with issues that are potentially dangerous, you know? So there is gonna be resistance, there is gonna be fear, and um, it's something, part of growth is being willing to decide whether you can be okay being with that aversion for a little while to move through it. Because sometimes we find that our fear of something is worse than that thing itself. Sometimes the fear is right on. Sometimes the fear tells you this is dangerous and maybe you shouldn't be involved in this situation right now. Sometimes fear comes up or this pulling back with certain situations like that difficult colleague or family member. And it's just because it's uncomfortable. It's an aversion to feeling yucky or tense. Or it'd be much easier to go watch TV than have to deal with her. But you also might realize that this isn't a person that if you could move through that and you guys could have a great conversation, that it might actually benefit the relationship, benefit your work environment or your family. So we have to work with that space a lot if we're trying to grow. And um, we have to stretch. And I'm going to talk about... Um, I want to show you some something about resistance and growth and these edge places by sharing you, um, those of you who've ever taken a compassion class from me have seen this before. This is um, a diagram that I've seen, I've encountered for years. It's been in, um, I know my compassion training circles for a long time. The first reference um, that I've been able to get to it um, is from this lear a psychologist who studied learning back in the early 20th century, Vygotsky, who um, had a version of this. But look at, let me explain what this means. Um, whenever we're trying to grow or change or learn something new, and let's talk about compassion as an example, you know, we have this safe place. This narrow circle is sort of the safe place. And the safe place can be those who we um, are um, comfortable being with, would readily extend our compassion to without any analysis. You know, it might be your family, your, your, your child, your pet, you know. It, it can, so that's that comfort zone or safety zone where everything feels just wonderful or easy. And the thing about this safety zone, it's not just about who you extend your compassion to. It's also about the feelings that can come up. Safety is also an emotional space of safety, of feeling comfortable and easy and relaxed and taken care of. And I'm going to um, contrast that to way out here when things that are way too much for us is overwhelm, right? It's like too much. This problem's too much. I'm not prepared to take it on. I don't know what I'll do. It, I might lose my center, whatever. It's too much. That's overwhelm. Like it's it, too much to handle. In between safety and overwhelm, is where the growth happens. Growth is almost an edge, but it's like there's an edge between growth and overwhelm. Meaning if we just stay in our safety zone all the time, we're not gonna grow, right? I mean, it's, and, and my first encounter, my, my most, the thing when I was thinking about talking about this, I mean, you all know this, we have to go through some obstacles in order to grow. Um, and, uh, you have to overcome adversity in order to grow. And one of the things, an analogy that came to mind when I was um, thinking about talking with you all today was just when back in high school when I first started r running long distance. I went out for track and I got recruited to go to track by my gym coach because I was relatively tall for a girl at that time and very skinny and long legs. So he wanted me to be a long jumper and I was not good at long jumping, <laughs> but I decided to start running. And I just started running around the track and, and the most I'd ever done was like two or three laps for some physical education test before that. I'd never run a long distance. But that first day, kind of egged on by my friends and realizing, just keep going. You can do it. Just keep going. I went kind of past that. I ended up w running five miles on the track that first day. Never thought I could do that. And I pushed beyond... Now, this is just exercise, but any of you who do any kind of physical exercise or working out know what I'm talking about. You get to this point where it feels aversive. It's yucky. And then the question is, are you going to pull back? Or are you going to try to go through? 
And that's an evaluation you have to make. And, and we know there's many cases where your body's telling you it's in pain. And if you push through, you've made a mistake. But you might assess it and go, okay, I, can, I know I can go a little further. And I go a little further and I did it and go a little further and I did it. And it's sort of like if you're, you know, um, and then the first time you do these things, it might hurt a little bit. But as your body adapts to it, as, it's, as it grows, it doesn't hurt as much. That that metaphor from exercise, you know, that works with any of these things. When you get used to being in that slightly uncomfortable territory where people might have hurt feelings, where, um, where you might have hurt feelings, you, and you know how to kind of find your ground and be a little bit more spacious in it, you can, first it might be tough, but you get better at it. And then maybe you reach a little bit more. So it's these places where you're kind of on the edge between feeling comfortable and feeling really uncomfortable, right? Or um, where growth occurs. So we need to push out a little bit. If you stay in the safety zone or the comfort zone all the time, um, you're not, you're not going to be able to grow. So when you're w dealing with compassion, when you're dealing with this um, engaged compassion, we really have to start looking at aversion, how we respond to aversion, and um, what we're feeling there and what it means to us. So I'm going to actually um, stop the share again and see if there's any questions. I've been covering kind of a, a lot of stuff. Um, any questions on what I've covered? Thoughts? Anything to add? And I'm doing, you know, broad uh, a broad sweep over topics without, like, formally laying out every detail. Do you know what I mean about being in that space? I saw, I saw one, there was one friendly face who happened to be on my screen and was nodding up and down a lot when I talked about this thing with um, exercise and, and reaching out. How, oh my God, there's Sal. Hi, Sal. You know what I mean, right? When you have to, when you reach this edge, it feels a little hurt. You know, and I hate to use like cliches, no pain, no gain, but that, that's, so, there's a reason why these sayings become cliche because there's something about it that rings true, right? And so we do have to hurt a little bit. Now, the, this is why it's so important in the process of growing your compassion to have the um, done the service to yourself of worked with self-compassion and be aware of the status of this thing, you know? Are, do you, you know, you need to know when you're pushing yourself too far. And if you have, give yourself some time to repair. There's a fine line between, sometimes we have to be careful though, because people say, oh, that's aversive, that I'm pushing myself too far. Some people, you know, you, you don't want to use that as an excuse for avoiding going into that gnarly place, you know? So having that in check as well. And um, as one story, relevant piece is, years ago I was teaching a compassion class and and working with meditations where we had both, you know, you're working for a loved one and we have a practice where you're developing loving kindness for a loved one, wishing them well. But then there's another part of the practice where you're working on compassion for a loved one and you really imagine a time when they were suffering and wish that you could help them and you work with that. And um, I, one thing that can come up in that class, I've had people say things like, um, I just wanted to work with, I only worked with the loving part of that because that one felt good. I didn't want to work with the compassion part of it because I didn't want to think about this person's suffering. So what to say to that? Any thoughts on how to respond to something like that? What, what do you think about that? I know I have some compassion teachers in here. Not to put you on the line, but just to generate some discussion if anybody wants to talk. Anything? I'll move on quickly given I just saw the time, man. This has flown by, but it's, well, just, I, I mean, you can't tell a person what to do, but basically that is, a, you can't really grow compassion unless you're willing to be present with suffering. And that's why suffering, suffering is sort of the, the key, is what distinguishes compassion from loving kindness more than anything, right? Loving kindness is about, you know, oh, may you be happy, may you be well, may you flourish, may you have all these, you know, really imagine you to, to, to have all these good things, you know, and that's great and it's rich, but the, there's this other side of the coin that sometimes people really are miserable and are going through hell and they're suffering. 
And the compassion piece is, can I bring that love in me and concern to your suffering and make a difference? So it's going to require a little bit of edging into it, you know, finding something that's aversive that feels manageable, like putting your toe in the cold water of a pool, you know, and the more you hang out there, you start adapting to it. Um, so just to be mindful of this tendency that you that aversion is informative and it's important, um, uh, but it's going to be there and it's part of the territory when you're growing compassion. Um, I want to say a few things. I'm never going to get to everything I want to say today. It's already clear, but I want to say a few things about some of the emotions that come up in this work and I want to share my, one of my favorite quotes about emotions from Rinpoche, Tartan Tolku Rinpoche, the founder of Nyingma Institute. This is a um, quote from one of my favorite books of his. This is the old cover. You won't see it, this cover anymore. Openness Mind used to look like this, but it's got a different cover now. Um, but this is on page 51. I say it in almost all my classes. We can be grateful for our emotions, for our frustrations, fears, and sorrows. They help us wake up. They show us something. We have no clear message about what's happening in our lives. Our emotions show us where to direct our attention. Rather than obscuring the path, they can clarify and sharpen it. And um, with that basic, you know, because if we're afraid and we notice that we're afraid, that's telling us that something here or in our minds feels threatening. That's, a, that's good to know that we felt threatened. There might be a threat around. So that's an indication. Okay, I feel threatened. Now, assess the situation. Maybe there is a real threat. Maybe it's a threat you can handle and you're a little agitated about it and it's safe to move in. Or, you know, maybe you're threatened. It's like, why am I, you ever walk, you know, and someone shows up you've had trouble with, they walk in and your belly tightens or you're like, you get like this because you don't want to engage with them. You know, um, that's informative. Why am I so tense right now? If something happens and you get real irritated, that tells you for you know something you thought saw something was wrong or you felt insulted yourself. Anger can have those kind of causes. So emotions themselves tell us about the sense we've made of a situation. Is it threatening to me? Is you know it, it might I get harmed? Might I might, might I encounter obstacles? Might I encounter injustice? Might I lose something dear to me? Which sadness can tell us. So emotions are informative. We, we should pay attention to them. And when you're working with compassion, um, a lot of emotions can come up. Here are some of the states that I think are really important um, for this kind of fierce compassion. Fear is the first I'll mention because often, you know, you might be dealing with a situation that's dangerous. You know, I mean, looking at some of these, in, in, you know, we're dealing with situations like Let's see, you see, let's say you see someone unjustly being attacked or someone just had their purse stolen and, um, or, um, you know, you're trying to, you know, defend somebody who's defenseless against harm. Those could be potentially dangerous. And, you know, you have to assess a situation, decide whether you have the resources to do anything and can you be of any benefit. Um, but so fear is an important thing to notice it can motivate you and also be mindful of how it can get out of hand in situation. There might be a situation where you do, you are equipped to move in at least on some level, but if the fear spirals, then you need to learn how to work with the fear before you can go in again. You know, sometimes we might need to be, we might be afraid when we move into something dangerous. It's, it's an adaptive response, but can we, can we do something slightly scared or do we get paralyzed by it? Anger, um, and I'm just glossing over this. There's so much more that needs to be said, but I'm going to say something about um, anger. I mentioned anger, you know, injustice can motivate you. It can be a powerful motivator for um, a compassionate response. But um, to be mindful of the tendency to carry that rage through your action, um, rather than, you know, to, to be anger, to be enraged, but to allow that emotion to inform you, to inform your action, and not be sustained at a high level. Because that is destructive, not only to others, meaning you might bring more fire to an interaction than is necessary to remedy a problem and cause more harm. Or it could also wipe you out. Like when we talk about anger, uh, one of my colleagues, Margaret Cullen, likes to say um, anger is an inefficient fuel. It burns hot. 
You know, we burn it out fast. And so if you're always enraged, you're going to get exhausted. It's going to lead to burnout, which is a real problem in people who are engaged socially with compassion. So um, be, be, you can be informed by anger, but not always acting in a state of anger. And there's a lot of work with emotion regulation that you can do with um, meditation and other practices that can make a difference and are important for the maintenance of your ability to make a difference. Two other emotional um, domains that are important here. One is sadness. Um, you know, we talk about seeing suffering and being moved by it. So you might be enraged by something, but you might be deeply saddened by suffering that you see. You know, like a grieving child after someone, his father was killed. You know, or uh, someone homeless needing food um, in the street. So the suffering can move you, and sadness is a deep and profound emotion that plays a big empathic role in the cultivation of um, compassion. But what we have to be careful of is we have to watch out for um, empathic distress, Um, not be warned, beware. Beware empathic distress. So sometimes if we're, we're really moved by someone's suffering, we can get so overwhelmed by our emotional response to it that we can't, we can't get to that compassion stage. We can get um, burnt out by our own distress. This is one of the sources of burnout that um, when we're talking about people who are in helping professions who get wiped out, get burnt out, it's often because of the sustained distress at the reaction to other people's suffering. This can also lead to hopelessness and despair, like you can't do anything, and it deactivates you rather than activates you. Um, I think the last thing I'll talk about, that I have a few other things to get to, but the last thing I have time for, and we look at like some of the emotions of um, engaged or fierce compassion, I have to mention this thing called the warm, warm glow of giving, or the feel-good aspect of helping, which, you know, uh, those of you who like to help, I... Um, it's great to help. It's even it's just a little thing that you want to do to extend your boundaries, to open the door for someone you didn't, to be a kind gesture or a slight conversation with someone who's reaching out to you um, or um, giving money to someone, giving food to someone, reaching out. It feels good. It often feels good. People love to help. Even children and even rats like to help. I mean, it's they'll give up chocolate to help their friend get out of pain. This is an interesting research on rats. So helping is deep in the, in mammals. It also goes to other um, non-mammalian species. We love to help, but it feels good. So that's a great thing, and it can motivate helping. But you have to be careful of it because you have to. If your intention in helping is to get that good feeling, then you can run into trouble because sometimes your actions are not appreciated, even if so. It looks like you you can be you know, let's say you give, some people get upset when they help somebody and they don't say thank you. You know, well, if you're helping because you think it's a benefit, then do the good thing and don't require the thank you. The thank you might feel good, but it's not required. You know, so be aware. these are just some signposts. Um, I have to jump ahead, but I want, if, if you want to say just a couple more minutes, um, I'll share, I want to say a couple things on practices for compassion warriors. So things that I think, and I should also say, um, I'm developing a workshop on fierce compassion with my friend and colleague, Jenaba Kelly, another compassion teacher. She and I have been working on developing a fierce compassion workshop. These are some of the things that I've been um, just offering as tips right now. Cushion work meaning meditation practice type things, there's the value of stilling the body and mind and exercising certain capacities without the distracting challenges of those problems in the world. Um, giving yourself that um, permission to learn to stabilize your awareness, learn how to relax yourself, cultivate reinforced self-care and concern for others. All of these things um, can, are important for preparation for being a compassion warrior or fiercely compassionate, but also they're crucial for maintenance. Um, movement, keep your, you know, this is part of the self-care. Don't forget to move. Don't forget to get exercise. Practice with extending your limits in life. This is to, like it's stretching your kindness muscles. So maybe there's somebody a situation like even if it like 
It could be political activism. Oh, I want to make a difference in selection, but I'm a little nervous about going on the phone and talking to people. This is a minor thing, but you know, okay, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I talk to all these people. I give international talks. I can get on the phone and make a political call and just do it. This is where that Nike thing, just do it. There's a, there's a lot of value in that teaching. Try it. You survived. Do it again. Right. Or offer to help someone out, you know, like, you know, maybe even during these times of lockdown, you're going to the store and you have elderly neighbors and it's not safe for them to go to the store. See if there's anything they need, you know, little things that are stretching yourself beyond what you normally do. Because like anything, the more you try it, at first it might be painful. At first, it might not be easy, but you can do it. And with some of these helping things, you then get this added benefit. I, I, I love that warm glow. I'm, I'm, I love it. I'm going to admit it. And so if you help and it feels good, yay, help some more. Just be careful of always requiring the feel-good element to come out of it. So extend your limits. Try it out. Try doing something that feels a little aversive. Try doing something that feels a little hard. And if you know that you can get it and you should be, your rational mind says you should survive, try it and see. Usually it reinforces more trying of that stuff. Um, but if you, try, if you went too far... Pull back and try something easier. Rest and nutrition. Don't forget fun and play. It's super important for keeping things light if you're somebody who's trying to do deep work. you got to have it as a balance. And I have just mentioned, I put this at the bottom uh, just in case you're interested, but I have this last slide say, um, because I'd be amiss if I didn't mention that I'm teaching a workshop on compassion at the Institute online on Zoom um, Saturday Valentine's weekend, which is a great time to teach a compassion workshop, I think, from 10 to 1. It'll be basic compassion, working with practices, not much talking. I mean, I'll be talking, but it's not a lecture thing. We're working with meditation and other practices to unlock the strength of your heart. Um, and um, I will be having an eight-week compassion cultivation training course coming up in the spring. Um, if any of you are interested, you could go to my website because that is probably to find out more about that when it's announced. I haven't announced that yet. Um, to follow, just to get updates on what I'm doing. So, I didn't leave a lot of time at the end. I stopped a couple times throughout, but I'm willing to stay a few more minutes if um, for anybody who wants to talk or has questions or comments about anything. Anybody? I do. Yay, Sal. Hey, hey, hi everybody. Um, uh, my cousin, so, my cousin in LA. <laughs> uh, in full disclosure, this is my cousin who I adore and love for the duration of my life, and um, this is amazing. So, I I apologize for being late. It's and, okay. And, um, I am viewing this through the lens of a person in long term recovery. The recovery community in Orange County, and I think throughout the world, is um, slammed slammed with people coming in also people dying from multiple substances a lot of fentanyl overdoses but also classic alcoholism and i'm viewing this through the lens of someone in long-term recovery and when you talk about um self-care and resistance and fear and i'm looking at it through trying sometimes dealing with somebody who is um not of sound mind or possibly under the influence because that's the reality of it. Right. And, and I'm wondering, I don't know, I just want to get, I just wanted to make that comment, how applicable and, and helpful this information would be. And I intend to steer some other people. Uh, there's a lot of us sponsoring a lot of people. I'm sponsoring so many people now I'm burned out. You be careful. And, yeah. So um, this, it's just a tricky line to walk and this, right. this fear and not knowing sometimes it's a frightening situation. So um, I think that for someone like me, this requires digging in a lot deeper, and I intend to do that. So I thank you for the, the, thank you. the information thus far. And thank you for your service. Um, it's, it's deeply important and, and incredibly difficult work. And, um, but just to make a comment about the importance of self-care and maybe something, you know, that feeling of supporting so many people and not have anything left for yourself. Um, and even it, even if it's hard to think about they're suffering so much worse, so it's hard to focus on me. One way to spin the self care thing is to also realize you, that you can't be of help if you suddenly break, you know, 
suddenly breaks. So find, you know, keeping that in mind in, you know, the decisions about taking new things on and what you can, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, so I implore you both as a, as a teacher and as, as your cousin, <laughs> you know, um, to, to attending to that, because it's that thing I said in the beginning, I'm not sure if you were online yet, but one of the things that comes from the tra- people working with trauma, helping others with trauma, um, um, my colleagues in, in that field is that self-care is non-negotiable and that, that it's, it's, it's got to be a mantra, you know, and, um, and, and even if you just can take a few minutes to do like, I got to step out, I got to get the breather or I have to schedule with like, if I'm going to be with a lot of people or if you're meeting with people online now or whatever, I need to have a half hour between them, but, you know, so that I can kind of get my bearings, get, get a snack, you know, and be more present, you know, so even if your ultimate goal is to be the best, most you know, to be as of much service as possible, that as possible is key. And you're just you know, sort of like, you know, this is kind of a lame metaphor, but it, it works. You know, you can't keep driving if the fuel tank's empty, you know, so not forgetting that. Fill your own cup first. Fill your own cup first. Yeah. Or, you know, like in the plane with the, the oxygen, if you're there with I... a child, put yours on first, then help them because they're, you're not going to do them any good if you die. You know? Right. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I should probably start th- stop there because it's 10 after. Thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed um, being here for this. And um, thank you, Nyingma Institute. And yeah, check out our programs online, upcoming classes. And I'd love to see some of you at the uh, February workshop if anybody's interested. Um, okay. Take care.